by my clock, it's it's 10 a.m. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this, which is the latest of our short, but hopefully very helpful COVID related video sessions. Uh, we're in conversation today with two of my colleagues, uh, particularly focusing around the interaction between health and safety, uh, returning to work, getting the workplace ready, and the impact that that may or may not have on privacy. Um, now, we're, we're very conscious that there are a number of overlaps between um, health and safety and privacy, um, also health and safety and the way that our employees might react to the changes that we have to make in the workplace. We have a separate session on Tuesday specifically relating to health and safety and employees. So if you want to join us for that, that's great. But we won't be picking up on that today. Um, I'm Steve McNichol. I'm chairing the session. So hopefully you won't hear too much uh, from me. Um, we've got about half an hour. Um, so we've got everybody on mute. If you'd like to ask questions, please use the chat function. We'll try and pick them up, but we are a bit pressed for time. Um, but we can deal with them on the hub as, as a, a series of FAQs, if that would uh, be really helpful. Um, a last thing probably to say uh, before I introduce uh, Phil and Tris is that um, my connection has been playing up a little bit this morning. So if I disappear all of a sudden, it's not through lack of interest. Uh, it's purely because the kids have stopped pedaling downstairs. Um, so I'll try and rejoin as quickly as I can. But frankly, if I'm not here, uh, you've got the two people that know everything that you need to know uh, speaking with you anyway. So um, let me just introduce our two um, in conversation panelists today. We've got Tristan Mears-White uh, and Phil Tompkins. Fist, uh, Tristan specializes in helping businesses with regulatory compliance and risk management. And Phil is a commercial advisor, but he is our resident data protection and privacy guru. Um, so they are bang on for the, the, uh, the subject matter that we're going to talk about today. So why don't we start by just asking a very broad question, gents, uh, about how we're going to get back to work. Um, I think we all know that uh, there's going to be a new norm, but um, get your crystal balls out. And what might that new norm really look like, Tristan? Well, I suppose to some extent, I think we all would agree that the working world, as we knew it, ended at the towards the end of March. And we've, we have a landscape in front of us, which seems familiar at first glance. But I think on closer examination, we all find it's very different. It's going to take some getting used to. Um, one, one of the contextual issues here is around, you know, employers needing to understand the anxieties in the workforce about returning to work. There was a TUC survey um, published the other day which indicated around just over 40% of workers describe themselves as worried or very worried about returning to work. So as well as thinking about the legal statutory obligations that businesses have in getting people back to work, employers have really got a hearts and minds hurdle to get across in order to just make the workers feel that they're safe when they're going back to work. So um, that's a bit, of, a bit of context. I mean, we're in a strange place in the UK. I mean, we, we could look at it as something of an advantage in that the stage that we are at in managing the spread of the virus um, gives us an opportunity to look at what's happening overseas around Europe and into Asia and assess what's going on, borrow maybe, borrow some of the more effective approaches that uh, we can see being rolled out. Um, a lot of other countries are further down the track emerging from lockdown, starting to reopen businesses. So this, there are gonna be some lessons we can take on board, I think. Um, if I was asked to name the sort of three key issues that I think we're gonna, are gonna affect all of us, and, and you know, we talk about the new normal, what's gonna become this new normal? I'd say the, the, the sort of more, or the potentially more permanent move to increased levels of home working, I think that's, uh, that's almost inevitable. Um, more rigid, long-term social distancing behaviours um, inside the workplace, of course, outside as well. Um, and, you know, obviously, um, the continuing importance of effective, suitable PPE in terms of managing the virus risk. So yeah, that's a kind of, con you know, a bit of, bit of context and a bit of, uh, you know, background is what I think the new normal um, might look like. Okay, thanks, Tris. The, the one thing that you mentioned there, there's, there's obviously... Um, a number of other uh, countries that are at different stages in in their planning um, and execution of actually um, getting getting back to business and trying to return to the new norm. Um, if we were looking at some of those um, overseas um, countries, economies that have started to to make those moves, what what can we learn from them? How can we make sure we're not running down blind alleys? Are, are there particular examples that you can you can steer us to? 
Um, well, I, I guess the, the approach that the, uh, Germany took in controlling the spread of the virus, um, the testing and tracking regime, same thing as, is, is, as, as we've seen in, in, in South Korea. Um, I think most of us would agree that's been a relative success. Um, so uh, looking at how they're approaching returning to economic activity is probably a, a decent place to start. So um, the German authorities, um, their, their opening position in terms of what they're saying to employers is exactly what has been said in the UK, work at home if it is at all possible. And I think that working at home, keeping people out of the workplace to minimize the, uh, minimize the risk as much as, uh, as we can, it's a common trend across the world. And it's one we're seeing in, in, in South Korea, China, as Italy and Spain are moving towards a potential um, restart, as it were, they're doing the same thing. And I think that will, that's got to be, uh, remain the default p advice. The difference we're seeing is that the Federal Ministry of Labour in Germany have, uh, have codified and uh, created a number of what, what they, do they call occupational safety standards. So these are codified in law as to what businesses have got to do, not um, might do or can do their best to do, but what they, they, they must do. And uh, those, uh, again, some of them will sound quite familiar, maintaining a 1.5 metre distance between employees and customers, um, including outdoors, vehicles, etc., using appropriate barriers and markings. But if they can't do that, then they must provide face masks to employees um, and to customers. Uh, a direction that tools and equipment that are being used have to be personal, so you can't share sh share tools and instruments if you if you can possibly avoid it. The reorganising process to minimise contact between employees and, and customers, changing shift ch uh, shift shift patterns, the way breaks are run, the use of facilities in the workplace, all of those things are fairly familiar, and I think will almost certainly find their way into the into into the UK process of managing this emergence out of out of full lockdown. But as I say, the difference here is that they're codified, they're, they, they, are, they are made, uh, made, made uh, legal obligations. And at the moment, these, these things have not reached that stage in the UK. A good example in Germany's uh, Volkswagen and uh, their, the way they're opening their manufacturing plants, very much a graduated return to production. So starting very small, 15% of uh, produ usual production levels. 1.5 meter uh, floor markings everywhere in the factories, increased levels of supervision so that they're trying to police these social distancing measures. Um, but over there, an interesting uh, one is that they're, VW are requiring employees to take their own temperatures before um, coming into work, as well as changing into their work clothes at home, not changing in any shared facilities at work. So um, interesting that, Inter interesting that, the, that that sort of compulsory te temperature taking. I'm not sure how that would um, how that would work in the UK. And, and Phil, presumably, doesn't that raise some sort of data protection, privacy concerns, or at least questions? Yeah, absolutely. Because under COVID nineteen, all uh, organisations are going to be starting now to gather a lot more health data than they than they have in uh, previously. Um, and under the Data Protection Act and uh, GDPR, um, health data is special category data. And um, hopefully everybody knows that with special category data, um, you have to find uh, lawful processing conditions. So you're not only finding the, what, the, the con a condition to process it under Article 6 of the, the, the GDPR, but also you need a lawful basis under Article 9. And as, as, as Tristan says, uh, it's, you know, it's interesting because where, where Germany has codified it under GDPR, that gives you a, that gives you an open door to be able to to then uh, use it under Article Nine. If we don't have uh, something like that, what we've got to then do is find another Article Nine condition. We've probably got one in that it's necessary. Uh, you, you can take an example of say, you know, um, taking employee temperatures. You could probably say that that's necessary to provide a, a safe place of work and therefore fits it within a a, 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 you know a special category um, processing lawful processing condition but it's it's not as clear-cut and, and we're seeing differences across Europe I know that Spain's done a similar thing to Germany but I also know that France has specifically said don't take employee temperatures because it's a breach of uh, the GDPR so we've got a, a you know a mixture here I suspect that the UK would take a a, 
uh, a more they've always the ICO in the UK has always been a very pragmatic regulator and I suspect that we'll get a uh, you know a middle ground and um, I imagine that you know it, you, you would be able to justify it, say, it prolong, uh, provided that you could say it was necessary. Okay and Tris going back to what you were saying before you talked about the codified approaches that that some other uh, um, countries have taken how do you think the, those types of approaches that you've been talking to fit into the current health and safety statutory duties that exist in the in the UK? Well, I don't think that there doesn't appear to be any kind of appetite to change the law at this stage. And um, so, so we're, I think we have to take a step back and look at what the, the sort of basics of health and safety law require of us as employ, employers, i.e. that we have to take all reasonably practicable steps to ensure that our workers are safe and also to undertake suitable and sufficient risk assessments. Um, so as ever, you know, I, th I think as with all workplace risk, the, the quality and the, <coughs> um, com you know, how comprehensive risk assessments are is going to be absolutely uh, critical. Um, the context of this is, is, is slightly more tricky because we have very much evolving UK government and HSE advice. And at the minute, there's a, a bit of circularity as to the advice. So if you go looking for advice on the HSE's website, it's linking you into the .gov website, which in turn links you back to the HSE's website. So there's a bit of circularity there. Um, and, and, and some of the guidance is very, very limited at the minute, um, probably unhelpfully so. Um, but, but, but the reality is, in terms of those, those core requirements, taking all reasonably practicable steps, that has to be done in, in, in the context of the um, government's advice. Uh, so in practice, I think as that advice evolves, whatever risk assessments businesses come up with are going to have to be reviewed pretty regularly. And you know, tricky issues around things like compulsory temperature taking or testing, um, and how that's going to be going to be managed, could depend on how government advice evolves. I mean, just an example, a very brief example, being that uh, up till yesterday, government advice on wearing face masks in public or on public transport was that they weren't necessary. But then there's an indication given in the press conference last night that in fact use of public transport is going to require um, uh, passengers to to wear potentially to wear masks now you know that's that, that sort of evolving advice is going to be relevant as to how your risk assessment is put together okay um, and so i suppose from a practical point of view that 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 begs the question given given the the vast range of and and diverse nature of the businesses that that are on here listening to us today um, how, how do we go about conducting and planning for uh, a risk assessment um, to, to manage something that is evolving so, so quickly and actually, um, give, given that we are, to use that phrase that everybody is using, we're in uncharted territory? Yeah, it, well, it's, it's true. And, you know, I'm, 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 I expect that most of the, most of the um, people who are on this call will be familiar with risk assessment and will have undertaken risk assessment and know how it works. And, you know, there's a, there's a very... I think businesses in this in this country are very good at doing this. They're very good at assessing risk and coming up with systems of work. Um, if you look sort of globally, most jurisdictions take a very similar approach as to how they assess risk and the hierarchy of controls that um, that safety professionals talk about. And even, you know, in China, if you look at how the Chinese um, states Wuhan has come out is moving out of um, of lockdown, there's emerging evidence there um, as to how they're adopting a similar approach in terms of hierarchy of controls. And they start at the point where they say, right, okay, avoid, eliminate, substitute. So avoid, have people work at home if you possibly can. The same thing as we're seeing in Germany and in Spain and in Italy. Um, but then as they move down the risk controls, actually there's not much you can do in the terms of elim in eliminating and substituting. We can't eliminate the virus. We can't substitute the virus for anything else. And so the path of risk control leads to administrative control, so it's changing process in the workplace, changing work practices, the sorts of things we talked about before, about uh, you know, the, the 1.5 meter distancing, not allowing or, or controlling the use of shared facilities, that sort of thing. But in China, where it's ending up is at PPE. And PPE generally, we're taught as risk professionals or as uh, anybody involved in risk management is, PPE is kind of the last resort. But here, it seems to be pretty much where, you know, where businesses are ending up, disposable gloves, face masks, prompts to constant prompts to wash hands, that sort of thing. So 
as far as to where a business starts, well, you know, first of all, you've got to decide who needs to return to work. Um, when do they need to come back? Um, as many as people as possible uh, should continue to work at home as they can because it's a key control measure. The fewer people coming back to the workplace, the, lo the lower the risk. Um, I mean, the, the issues are, are, are a myriad and we probably haven't got time to run through them all, but some of the things we need to be thinking about is the workspace itself. How is it laid out? How do we make sure it's kept clean and hygienic? You know, what are we doing to support cleaning staff if they if we're wanting increased cleaning and and hygiene measures? How do we support them um, in practice? How do we keep people apart? Uh, there's uh, we're seeing in some um, call centre and office environments uh, if they if they're working in um, open plan increased um, barrier protection between workspaces. So use perspex screens between workspaces to try and get that physical separation. Um, practices around how we use workplace facilities, toilets, with something as basic as that. How do we control people going in and out? Um, how do we, uh, if we're going to rely on PPE, can we get it? That's a, you know, it seems you know, there's a supply chain issue here at the minute. And if, if we do get it, is it suitable? I've heard anecdotal stories of people organizations ordering PPE and then the stuff that arrives isn't the specification that they'd they need to work safely in, the, in their industry. Um, what about customer interactions? How can we limit that? We've all we're all becoming quite used I think to using uh, platforms like this like Zoom and and Teams and you know that, that instead of having these face-to-face -face meetings with customers and clients that's this is the way that it's going to be for some time you know using these sorts of platforms and we need to be and there has to be infrastructure to back that up. Uh, what about um, fire safety? What about first aiders on site? There are requirements around that. And if you've got lots of people uh, working remotely, how, can we can we meet those requirements? Is there going to be a need for extra training? There's lots and lots to think about. And, he, and when we've gone through that process and we've thought about all those areas of risk, we then have to re record it and then we need to train it out to our people. There's a lot. Of, there are a lot of challenges to be met here. But as I go back to the beginning of what I said, most of the people on this call, most of the most businesses in this country are very good at assessing risk and will and, and will we'll, we'll follow the, the process they're probably quite familiar with. It's just this is a very unusual one to manage. And, and Phil, as, as part of managing that risk, I, I guess it, it's inevitable that, that we're going to want to start in some way to monitor the health of our employees, particularly given given the R number that, that appears um, to, to be all over the press at the moment and people being acutely aware of, 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 of the rate at which this, this disease transmits. Uh, what, what about data and privacy there? Yeah, I mean, with, you know, with, with, when we're looking at risk, we, you know, we also need to consider privacy risk. Um, I mean, the starting point when, you are, when you're looking at gathering all of this data, your starting point has to be your employee privacy policy. So every organization knows, or everybody knows that you've got to have a, or you have a privacy policy on your websites. But do you have a privacy policy for your employees? Now, you should have. It's actually a legal requirement on you. But I know from my dealings with organizations that a number of them don't have them. Or if they've done them, they've, uh, they've uh, just bought something off the shelf or something. What you need to be doing is making sure that your employee privacy policy will cover you for this kind of processing. Because otherwise, it's a breach of the GDPR. So make sure, take a look at your employee privacy policy. That would be my starter for 10. Um, the other thing that I think you need to be doing is, you know, as with as with uh, Tristan and health and safety is risk assessments. Now, you know, risk assessments in health and safety, we've we've been doing them for, for, for decades now. So we know where we're at. Risk assessments for data protection. I don't think we're as good at that. We, in the public sector. I think they're very good in the in the private sector. I, I'm not sure that it's that, that, that the message has come through um, sufficiently yet. And, you know, a. Uh, what, in risk assessments, what we're talking about in data protection is a data protection impact assessment. Um, they're actually a requirement on organisations um, where there is a type of processing which creates a high risk uh, to the rights and freedoms of individuals. And specifically, the ICO guidance says that uh, such an example or something which would cause a high risk is uh, where there is large scale processing of special category data. A uh, you know, and voila, we have that now, don't we? And so what could you do about risk assessment and what could you do? Well, you know, take again, again the example of um, taking employee temperatures. Um, you know, 
uh, you look at a data protection impact assessment, what you meant to do is you meant to identify, assess, minimize risk, take it, you know, uh, put in place uh, mitigation measures. So you're going to take the temperatures of your staff. Well, do you need to keep the data? I mean, you know, once the, yeah, is it is, if you take the temperature, do you actually need to, to, to you know to keep the, all of that data, or is it just a oh you you've passed, you're in, or you you know you failed, you're out? Um, do you need to actually you know think about the data that you're keeping? So you're taking employee temperatures. Do you actually need to know the the the, the reading? You know, do, or, or is it just a they were above or below thirty seven point five degrees? You know, the you know the the sort of the the, the normal human temperature or the new, normal max human temperature. I mean, also think about, you know, who, who needs to have access to that information? Does everybody need? Well, obviously not. You know, there's only a small um, number of people that need to have access to that information. So think about access rights as well. You know, and, and, and if you take a DPIA model, you'll see that you'll be able to work through, you know, where is the, where is the data that's being gathered? What are the privacy concerns? How can we mitigate against that to make sure that by doing this kind of activity that we're not creating a, a privacy risk in itself? Um, okay, uh, turning now perhaps to, to social distancing and another one of the new phrases that, that uh, seem to have become so commonplace in, in conversations these days. Um, Tris, have you got any examples of organisations that are, that are already starting to manage social distancing in, within their own businesses um, that, that, that you can perhaps share with us? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I guess all of us will will be very, very familiar with how the grocery retail sector has approached uh, social distancing, and uh, within within most of these uh, these retail settings, we have the uh, floor markings. That seems to be, um, uh, you know, one of the one of the key uh, key features. You see, like I mentioned VW in um, in Germany. But I'm, I'm aware of a, of a couple of manufacturing businesses who I, I, I give some help to doing the same thing. They're using, um, they're putting tape on the floor around their uh, manufacturing areas um, with with two meter um, gaps to try and help um, help the help workforce understand how far they need to be apart and to, to, to help guide that through. Again, in grocery retail, we've seen how uh, the point of sale has changed, putting up perspex screens between us and the and the um, uh, and the checkout staff. Uh, those sorts of barriers, I mentioned them in the context of a, of a call centre where, where they, they put these increased raised barriers to try and get that physical separation. Uh, in construction, which you know we're, we're told that uh, construction is one of the key sectors that's going to be um, encouraged to um, reopen sites and get back to work. Very tricky, but um, the, the use, use of physical barriers, again, to separate activities on site. Um, having fewer individuals or the minimum number of individuals working on a task so that um, you know, there, there's less opportunity for them to interact and you know trying to limit the number of occasions where they have to work on something on, where individuals work on something together even if it means things are done a bit more slowly uh, trying to schedule the work so that if there are indoor and outdoor works they're um, scheduled in such a way that those interactions are limited so that's you know, you know key in terms of maintaining the social distance um, be interesting to see how it works in offices. The you know these display the these perspex screens or or increasing the distance between desks um, in in uh, in in, in office uh, environments. Again, the key though is going to be this, that the fewer people there are in the workplace, the better. That allows you to um, have social distancing uh, measures more more easily maintained. The fewer people there are there, so it goes back to the first point, which is if you can work at home, <clears throat> work at home. Um, be interesting to see now outside of the grocery sector how retail deals with uh, reopening. <coughs> Pardon me. Stores, um, Greg's are opening 20 of their um, bakeries in the northeast in the next um, few days, just to see how they can they can manage social distancing. Um, overseas, uh, some of the smaller retail, seeing small retail in Germany, and even some of the. Um, uh, restaurants at reopening but only on a kind of takeaway basis or some of the, uh, the, of the big brands like Starbucks and um, and the like having tables out socially distanced tables outside and not allowing people to sit inside so you know um, a lot of this is going to be dictated to by the sector some sectors uh, it's going to be a little easier other sectors are going to be a lot harder anything where there's close uh, contact with customers or 
or clients is going to be very difficult to manage. And the only thing you can do there is to look at the at the, say, the guidance that's been given um, by the government. Interestingly enough, it's the Scottish government who've been a bit more proactive in terms of putting that together. So it's well worth a look at the Scottish government, um, uh, Public Health Scotland, I think it is, website website and the guidance they have for different industry uh, sectors on, on on managing this risk and on on use of public transport. It's been a, it's slightly more comprehensive than that available on the UK government's uh, sites. But all of this is going to rely on how keen we are as individuals to buy into this and um, and accept some of these controls. I don't think we'll have any choice, but that's what we're talking about in terms of the new normal. It's going to be a new way of working. I think we're all going to have to get used to it. And I suppose just picking up on, on that point, Tris, um, a, a lot of the, um, the, the success around these, these sorts of um, uh, uh, structures, new ways of working, the new norm that everybody uh, it is dependent upon the way that people react, uh, the way the public uh, interact with each other and the way that we will, will um, interact and, and, and behave with each other. So at the risk of of straying into the session on, on Tuesday, which is more than the employees. Um, as an employer, how do, we, how do we go about thinking about whether we can force employees to wear, for example, PPE or, or um, with social distancing? It's, it's difficult. I mean, from a health and, I mean, I'm gonna think of it just from a health and safety point of view. I'm not going to stray into the employment, um, employment law. But from a health and safety point of view, ordinarily, if you're an employer, you've assessed risk, you've got a safe system of work, and an employee refuses to stick to that say, system of work, then ordinarily it's a disciplinary matter and you know, that goes down one line. But in theory, it's also a criminal offence if um, employees don't take care of their own health and safety, or it's very rarely prosecuted, but it is potentially a criminal um, offence. I think there's going to be lots of tensions between um, between that sort of the health, the sort of straightforward health and safety requirements and employment law, and it's something that businesses are going to have to manage and be very much alive to. Yeah, um, I've got it there. Um, okay, well, if we if we look, we've talked uh, quite a lot about um, be, being in the workplace, um, but of course you've you've touched on um, on a couple of occasions the main premise or pretext of the, of the conversation which is if people can work at home they should continue to work at home does that bring with it um tris first of all safety issues and then um phil any any privacy issues we should be considering uh, well well certainly from <clears throat> from a safety point of view um home working does have its own problems uh, but it's it's one again i think a lot of businesses over the last few years have seen more agile working and more flexibility in the workspace so they're not going to be completely um at a, at a, you know uh, without any um understanding of this but um it's accepted that, that you know that there's the usual issues around workstations work equipment display screen equipment those sorts of assessments very well known to businesses most most organizations will have those those things pretty much nailed on the area it's going to be increasingly is going to be an issue is around work-related stress and and people's mental health. Uh, one of the issues is around being away from colleagues, being away from managers makes supervision and support more tricky. Um, we're seeing, you know, again used through platforms like this, businesses trying to make sure they're keeping in touch with people, putting in procedures uh, where so there's direct contact with with the workers who are at, at home. And you know, partly to um, you know, partly to just maintain communication lines, obviously, but also you know, for managers, you can you can help hopefully help you sort of recognise any signs of stress on in individuals. So group chats, but also individual chats are going to be important. Um, other things, again, people hopefully will have heard of these sorts of measures before, but um, having an emergency point of contact for for people. So if they are feeling um, anxious or um, or stress there's somewhere someone to go to somewhere they can call and you know uh, you know the, the, the message i think is is that we're going to have to be patient um th these are very anxious times and people are more anxious than normal and so productivity might not be as great and people might make a few more mistakes at the minute but i think as employers we're going to have to be quite understanding about that because you know we're in a very very um, strange space but the, you know, the, there's plenty to think about there phil yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, home working is a known data security risk. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 
the GDPR requires you to put in place appropriate technical and organizational security measures. So when you're working from home, there should be appropriate security in place. So in this rush, when we, when, when we all went into lockdown, um, you know, did you already have a home working policy? If you had a home working policy, was it um, just an, a health and safety home working policy or, or, or did you have actually a home working policy which dealt with data security issues as well? And, you know, and, and classic work from home data security issues are, you know, using home email addresses, which aren't particularly secure, um, using Dropbox or insecure social media to do uh, work communications. All of those, you know, are classic ways that a data breach could happen. You know, you, you might email, um, you might send an email over an insecure uh, 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 system. You might, uh, you know, attach a large file containing sensitive data and, and email it to the wrong person. All of this is, is classic data security breach territory. And one of the interesting things is whilst the ICO has made it clear that, it, 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 you know, it's taking a more flexible approach to um, some, some aspects of, of, of um, enforcement of the, of the rules of, of, of GDPR, it has made it absolutely clear that it's not uh, that it expects you still to notify data security breaches and also that it would bring enforcement ag action if there were a data security breach so it's it's not the you know they're, they're not taking the foot off the accelerator when it comes to breaches because breaches cause damage okay well, I'm, con I'm conscious that we are slightly over time but there's just one one quick question that's come through Tris that I, I wouldn't mind just touching on if that's okay um, what what are the recommendations around work assessment, workstation assessments for um, all employees so, uh, that, that are working from home, even if they're doing doing so on on an interim basis? Have you got? So I'm really sorry, Steve. You broke up right at the beginning of that. <laughs> um, we we've had just one quick question that I wanted to pick up on before we close, which is whether we recommend um, uh, or advise that workstation assessments are are taken for all uh, employees working from home, even if that's on an interim basis? I, th I, think, you, I think you would have to, even if it was um, a fairly basic assessment, just to, um, and it may, you know, it may be not possible for, for, to take, uh, you know, to have uh, you know, the sorts of office chair with all the adjustability that you have uh, in, a, in, a, in an office setting, but you will be able to give, make, give some guidance on things like taking frequent breaks, making sure that there's, you know, there's a, a degree of, um, uh, of of how the how of, of control as to how a desk is set up to be as good as it can be so that um, but pe you know the essential stuff is people taking frequent breaks and not staring at uh, computers all day getting up and walking around making sure that they're, um, uh, that they're not uh, seizing up as it were but those are those are fairly basic things I don't think there's um, I don't think there's any difficulty particularly in in even if people are working at home on an interim basis from conducting those very basic risk assessments I think it, you'd, you'd be expected to do that okay Thanks, Tris. Um, I think we need to bring it to a close there. I'm conscious we've run slightly over time, so uh, a sincerest of apologies for that, but I hope, uh, hope everybody that is uh, on the call has found that useful. Um, just a couple of things. Um, we're going to upload the recording to the hub, so if there are any of your colleagues um, or contacts that you think might benefit from having a quick look through or you want to revisit any of the points that we've discussed, have a quick look. That should be up on the hub by this afternoon. Um, on Tuesday, as I said, there's a, a slightly different version to this. Tris will be back with us, um, but we'll be looking at the relationship between health and safety and ad employees. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, the details will be coming out later today. Um, and that all that really remains for me now is to, is to thank Tris and Phil um, for their uh, time um, and their thoughts this morning and thank all of you for joining us. Thank you very much indeed. Have a good day and enjoy your weekend when it comes. Bye now.